Hello and welcome to Inside Out, a show where we focus on individual stocks with in-depth analysis, deep dive into the financials and tell you about the key risks and triggers going forward. Hey Nigel. Well, hey Sonal. Uh, we'll also put the spotlight not just on the key matrix that Sonal just mentioned. We'll ask questions that you want to ask. But let's not waste any more time. Let's get straight to the first stock that we're tracking. Sonal, you go first. What do you have for us on deep tech? Well, you know, the stock that I am tracking today and the company that I'm going to be talking about is a technical textile players. And we have seen their products in daily life as well. Garwadi Technical Fibers is the stock on my radar today, which makes nets for sports and fishing, twines for deep sea fishing market, industrial ropes, sports, agriculture and coated fabrics as well. It is the largest player for industrial ropes in marine horses. Has key customers like Reliance, we have Indian Navy, IOCL, ONGC, Indian Coast Guard, to name a few. And there are many segments that it caters to. Aquaculture, which is around 35%. We have fisheries at 25%. Sports is 15%. Geosynthesis at 10%. And other categories at 15%. The company exports 63% of revenues and exports to countries like US, France, Poland, UK, Colombia, Oman, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Australia. So a lot of names here. In terms of raw materials, most of them are crude derivatives. High density polyethylene, polypropylene, nylon, polyester yarn and GI wire. They are some of the raw materials that the company uses. So let's do one thing. Let's get in the management to understand more about the company business as well, right? We are now joined by Mr. Shujol Rahman, who is the CEO at the company, to take some questions and make us understand what the business is all about. Uh, Mr. Rahman, welcome to the show. So first up, as always, we would like to understand and get an insight into your products. Technical textiles, but what are the products this segment that you cater to? Tell us how big the synthetic cottage market is and how big are you as a player, globally and domestically? We operate in the overall technical textile space, which is a $200 billion industry globally. Uh, and it has got seven, eight segments, but we operate in three segments, which is uh, agri-tech, uh, geotech and sport tech. So these are the three segments that we operate in. 60% uh, of our business comes from products which are in a supply to uh, you know, companies or, uh, or farmers who are producing food or agriculture or fish or catching fish. So we are very closely related to food consumption globally. Uh, we have uh, about 65% of our sales coming from uh, international business in the overseas market and about 35% comes from domestic. In terms of key segments, uh, the biggest second segment that we operate is, is the aquaculture segment, uh, which is almost 40% of value uh, of, of global aquaculture. You know, you, you must be aware that protein requirement for, you know, the entire human population is increasing day by day. It's already 21 kg per capita and it's going to increase at the rate of 1% per year. So the demand for aquaculture is going to be there in the interim in the near future. And 40% of value is salmon. So we are in the salmon space. Uh, which is a big segment. We have close to 35 to 40 percent global share the salon space in terms of, uh, in terms of aquaculture cages and equipment that we supply. Uh, we are also entering uh, into non salmon, which is the rest 40 percent of value, uh, and we have made good strides. So that's the biggest segment, which is aquaculture. First. We also play uh, the segment of sports. We provide all kind of sports nets and equipments, uh, primarily for Europe and American market, and there also we are among the top player in the world. We are also a big player in both domestic mechanized fishing and international mechanized fishing uh, with a very high market share in India and a double digit market share globally. So these are three big segments for us, which is aquaculture, sports and uh, mechanized fishing. We also operate in uh, protected cultivation for agriculture. We operate in geosynthetic, uh, which is also a very profitable business for us. This is uh, about the overall uh, you know, segment that we operate. Oh, thanks, Mr. Rehman, for giving us that understanding. But I want to know more. Tell us what are the key raw materials that you use in your manufacturing for your products? And are they locally sourced or are they imported? So the biggest raw material is uh, HDP and polypropylene, which is uh, sourced locally. These are polymer-based products and obviously they depend on food prices. 80% of our raw material is sourced uh, locally from India and we buy from Indian companies. 20% uh, like UHMP, uh, nylon and polyester is imported. So 80% is sourced locally. Okay, that is about your uh, supply side. Let's talk about the products and the wide variety that you have available, which is the biggest uh, segment for you and the highest margin product for you as well. And what is the driver for growth? Is it volumes or is it pricing? Any new sectors that you're targeting amongst the ones that you already have? 
Uh, the sectors that we operate normally, eighty percent of our products are value-added products. So you know, margin across segments is 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 reasonably high. But you can say aquaculture is the highest margin uh, segment for us, followed by uh, fishing and uh, sports. So all segments that we operate, because we operate at top end and we have a value proposition for customers, we're able to command premium. So margin-wise, I think aquaculture is the biggest, but uh, other segments are also uh, pretty strong. In terms of new segments, we have we have. We have been entering into new segments. Geosynthetic is, geosynthetic is a segment where we have done well last many years. It's a very high ROC business for us. And that business is also growing. It's not a new business, but I think we're expanding in a big way. Apart from that, we have entered into material handling, which is just a, like a test launch for us, and also uh, personal protective equipment. So these are the two new segments that we entered, but this is early days for us. We're just doing test now. All right, uh, Mr. Rahman, let's focus on the export and domestic split. And whether export margins, are they higher than domestic margins for you? Give us some clarity. No, broadly, it's the same margin. I think export international will be slightly, maybe 1%, one, 2% one percent, percent more. But overall, I think uh, the margin profile in Indian uh, business is also very good for us because we operate in the domestic mechanized fishing market where we have close to 50, 55% market share. And uh, we, you know, we obviously try and give value proposition to our customer. Uh, for Indian fishermen, which is, let's say, almost a 10 million uh, population is dependent directly or indirectly in, on fishing in India. So the fishermen, obviously, the biggest cost is fuel. And we're able to show to him the fuel saving by using our products. Uh, as you may be aware, we are a company which is focused on innovation. We already applied for 81 patents and we've been granted 24 patents. So we spend a lot of time, effort, energy on innovation. 5% of our PAT is spent on R&D. So there's a lot of uh, innovation which we drive. And we, uh, the, our aim is to ensure that the customer gets value proposition and uh, you know his ROI, return on investment or profit increases by using our products. That's the overall intent. Got that, Mr. Rema. Just hold on to that. You know, just going to go across to Sonal and come back to you. Well, Sonal, run us through the financials. Crew derivatives uh, are their raw materials, right? Did it have some impact on margins? Well, you know, that's not been the case for the last couple of quarters, interestingly. Uh, but their revenue growth has not been very impressive, Nigel. At around 5% in the last five years, uh, revenue is at nine-month mark. They have come at 935 crore rupees, so they will be able to surpass FI22 numbers going by this. Margins, they have been hovering around 19% in last couple of years. So 19 to 20, and back at 16% now in nine months. Profit, too, has seen the same trajectory as revenues. From 105 crore rupees in FI19 to around 158 crore rupees now. Uh, let's talk about the expense split also because R&D as a percentage of sales is at 1.2 to 1.3 percent uh, for the company. So that is an important number to watch out for as well. Uh, Mr. Rahman, 60 percent of revenues from products developed for food related sectors for you, which makes it immune to demand fluctuations is what you told us. But despite that revenue growth has been lowered at 5 percent. Can you explain what led to that? What are the triggers possibly going ahead? As I mentioned to you, 80% of our sales comes from value-added products, which has been obviously moving every year. So there are certain segments where we are not focusing, which are very commoditized. So maybe we are giving away some volume and some share in those commodity segments. And hence, the overall mix is improving. Our margin is around 20% every time. We are maintaining that 20% margin. So as a result of this, you know, defocus on commodity segment, you can see that our volume uh, growth or value growth is not so high, whereas our margin is, is as far as going forward is concerned, I think the, now that we have reached 80, 85 percent, we are obviously going for trying to grow for uh, get go for let's say high single digit volume growth and close to double digit uh, margin growth or, or profit. That's our intent going. Forward. Well, Mr. Rahman, you are entering into newer products. Will that be margin accretive? Also, what is your margin guidance with the next you know four to five years in mind? So if you look at our products, uh, you know, the, uh, I can talk about a product called V2. So if you get, let's say, X dollar realization per kg by no, using a normal aquaculture cage, uh, V2 is, let's say, 2X two, two uh, dollar per kg. So a customer, when he uh, switches to V2, obviously realization improves uh, for us, margin improves for us, and there's a payback. So 40% reduction in you know, cleaning cost for a customer is what he gets uh, by using V2. So overall, it's a win-win uh, for the customer and for us. So our, overall, our margin improved. Uh, to answer your question, I think it's volume, it's value accretive for us, margin accretive going forward because of the innovation that we do. Mr. Rahman, R&D is not a big expenditure for you, but is this a pie which will go up from current levels considering that you are entering into newer products? How often do you file patent for a particular product and are these costs very high? 
So as I mentioned, one percent of our sales we invest in R and D. Five percent of our pat is all invested in R and D. We don't have a you know set pattern as to how much we should spend. Depends on insighting. We have a strong process of customer insighting. Depending on customer problems, we try and try and solve customer problem, and that's why we decide. So this is the time. Uh, let's say quarter one or quarter four of this year. Normally we plan for next year. We do a lot of insighting and understand uh, which segments uh, and which products do we invest. Uh, in terms of R&D, effort and time and energy. So this will continue. Uh, the, there's no ballpark range in terms of expenditure. If, if it needs uh, more expenditure, we'll be able to invest. It depends on the idea and, and, the, and the technology and the solution. Mr. Rahman, what about working capital days in an industry like yours? After COVID, did you make any changes to the way you deal with your inventory levels? So what happened in during COVID time? The biggest issue was getting container availability and freight rates had increased. Now, if you look at right now, uh, freight rates have come down by about 50 to 60 percent. Availability of container is not an issue. Overall, we have about let's say 60 days of uh, inventory and 30 days of net working uh, net debtors. So about three months investment is there uh, for us in terms of working capital, and that's the broad that you know broad uh, investment that we make. So it's not a big issue for us. What happened during supply chain issues of 22 and some part of 23, customers did try and uh, build up stock and they bought more. That inventory correction has now happened or is happening. I think as we speak also, we're getting good orders now in Q1 for this year. So the inventory correction has happened. Supply uh, supply chain problems are no longer there. Container availability is not an issue at this stage. Coming back to you, Mr. Rahman, but Sonal, tell us uh, some risk for a business like this. Uh, well, you know, since company exports to so many countries, it has 63% exposure to exports. Forex continues to be a risk for them. Input pricing pressure, of course, since crude derivatives are raw materials. And also some of these markets could be regulated for the sectors they operate in. So there are definitely some regulatory risks for uh, this particular company as well. So let me take that across to Mr. Rahman because, you know, you operate in so many countries. Is this a regulated space in any of the markets you function? Also, are you hedged against Forex risks that I just spoke about? Yes, yeah, so to answer your first question, uh, there are regulations. Uh, you know, entry is not easy uh, for for a, for a player because we need to take some, some approvals and uh, some you know, some level of uh, interfaces there with some of the board. We obviously, when we get approval, then we are able to sell. But since we are in the business for many years, obviously we have all the approvals. For, so for a new player, it's it's not easy to make an entry. As far as risks are concerned, I think uh, since it's related to food, 60-65% of business is linked to food, there's, there's no risk overall for us. You know, there could be some tax or regulations, you know, maybe something will happen. But overall, we, since we hold the most valuable part of the of the overall uh, product supply chain for customer, which is the which is the fish, so obviously they are not going to compromise on quality of our products. So we, I, I don't see any risk. Even the sports segment, I don't see any risk because colleges and, and sporting activities are growing uh, at a reasonable pace. As far as forex is concerned, obviously we always uh, we always hedge our forex. We don't try to make money out of it, but I think we 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 do it as a risk strategy, risk mitigation strategy. Well, Mr. Rehman, what's the updated number in terms of cash and books? Also, you have been continuously paying dividend, right? Will that be the strategy that you continue with, or are you figuring out some other ways to reward your shareholders? So we have had uh, two buybacks in the last three years or so. So, and uh, we always keep evaluating strategies to reward our shareholders. We're also evaluating options uh, for M&A, uh, but you know nothing is by in the pipeline at this stage. But we want to deploy some cash for M&A purpose, and we are think 400 to 500 crore cash uh, and balance sheet. Okay, so that's a big amount that you have in your book. So any expansion plans that you have in place, what is the current capacity utilization and what kind of capex will you be putting in if there are any expansion plans? So we have uh, modular capacity. So, you know, we can we can increase capacity as and when required and it doesn't need a huge investment. We are operating at about 75 to 80% utilization and we keep adding uh, capacity as and when required. We invest about 50 crore capex every year. That's for capacity expansion. Right now, there is no need for expansion. Uh, we have two plants which are you know, which are functioning well. Uh, we don't have a need for a third plant. We will probably be looking at some options of having manufacturing facilities outside India, but that is still in discussion mode. Okay, all right, Mr. Rahman. Final question before we let you go. Then you know, currently you're going at a run rate of around 1,200 crores per annum. At peak levels, though, what kind of a revenue number can you achieve, say, four to five years down the line? I can't give a number, but I think the intent is, as I mentioned, uh, try and have a low uh, single-digit growth in, in value and uh, double-digit growth in profit. That's the intent we have. 
and uh, we'll we'll keep uh, innovating and we'll keep going for new products and new solutions and keep upgrading uh, you know our customer relationships with us. All right, thanks so much for joining in, Mr. Rehman, and giving us an update on your business. Well, Sonal, before we wind down this conversation, give us a sense about valuations as well as the shareholding of the company. Okay, so let me start with the shareholding of the company. Uh, the promoters hold 52.7% stake. Uh, mutual funds are at 5.5%. FPI is whopping at 8.46%. And another listed company, Garware High Tech Films, is at 1.29%. As far as valuations are concerned, reasonable as far as the industry levels are concerned, uh, trades at 36.3 times uh, FY23 EPS Nigel. Well, thanks a lot uh, for that, uh, Sonal. So, that was a deep dive into Garvare Technical Fibers. But time to slip into a short break. We'll come back with another interesting stock on our Spotlight segment. Don't go anywhere.